Okay, so for today's webinar, um, this is not one of our traditional lunch and learns, but we do have our series of webinars each second Tuesday of the month from 12 to 1. Um, today's session does count for an ethics CE. We will have our regular scheduled webinars on April 14th and May 12th. You can register for both of those today if you go to the NASW Michigan website. We are also going to be continuing to put out resources and trainings that we come across as it relates to uh, COVID-19 as well as telehealth. So if any of you on the line today come across really good trainings, especially free trainings that are from legitimate sources, we want to hear about them so we can share them with our membership. Um, one of them that just came across my office today is uh, U of M School of Social Work is going to be doing a session, a free session, on uh, April 6th around teletherapy. We know that's probably a lot of folks on this, this call are transitioning your practices right now. So uh, please feel free to register through their website on that. I know PESI is also having a lot of sessions right now um, for free. So we're going to be sending out some more resources around things that we come across. Um, oh, I see Liz Gonzalez is hosting the U of M once on the line right now. Hi, Liz. So glad you're doing that webinar for U of M. Um, I'm already registered for that one myself. Um, so please share with us any resources that you have coming across. Um, your desk or your computer at home as you're working with us. I just also wanted to remind folks that we are doing a weekly member check-in call every Friday from 10 to 11 a.m. Uh, we are having a statewide Zoom meeting where NASW Michigan will provide what our most recent updates policy-wise and practice-wise around the COVID-19 pandemic are, as well as have an opportunity for folks to share resources that you are seeing in the field. So if you are able to attend any of those, you can register on the NASW Michigan website. They are capped at the first 100 people, so please make sure you get on um, if you're interested in those. For this Friday, we are also having our private practice and our aging work groups kind of tacked on to that scheduled Zoom meeting. So after that meeting is done at 11, we will have an additional half an hour for any folks in private practice or working in aging and gerontology to specifically be able to share resources and connect. So uh, you can sign up now on those. And then just as we talk about resources uh, specifically around COVID-19, I just wanted to remind folks that both NASW Michigan and the National Office have put out quite a few resources around COVID-19. The National Office also has a bunch of free trainings available, especially as it relates to technology and telehealth. And they've put out an ethical guide, eight standards of ethics to be thinking about during this, this time. Uh, the other resources I've put up on the screen are the Michigan.gov, so all of the stuff coming from the governor's office, and the CDC website. We will be recording today's session, so that will be put up online. All of our Friday meetings are also recorded and put up online. So if you missed last Friday's Zoom meeting, please feel free to watch that. Uh, the chat logs are also available. If you have any questions during today's webinar, please feel free to type those into the chat box. We will make sure that there is some time to get those answered. Um, but with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started here in just a minute. If you would like today's CEs, please make sure to fill out the short post test that will be emailed out. That will come one hour after we end today's webinar, so around uh, 2 p.m. today, check your inbox from GoToMeeting for that link. All right, so thank you again for your membership. I will transfer this over to Mary Ann, and we will get started here in just one minute. All right, Mary Ann, you should be good to go. Okay. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I um, hope that you are all doing as well as you can, given uh, probably one of the most strange and unusual situations I've ever encountered in my lifetime. And um, the hope today is that you'll find some meaningful takeaways for yourself, especially, and also for your practice as social workers. Um, I am hoping to cover kind of the gamut, some very, you know, some basic ways to cope with the anxiety and the uncertainty. 
um, and just sort of just sort of talking about what does it mean right now to be a practicing or a social worker um, in this particular environment, which is um, uncharted territory for most, if not all of us. So that's why it's called From Beyond Coping to Find Meaning in Crises. Hey, Marianne, just a quick um, note. Um, I can see your presenter view, so if you just go to your display settings and uh, change that real quick, that should get us the full screen. Perfect. What presenter, is that better? Yep, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. I wanted to make sure I included a slide from Dr. Victor Frankel, who wrote Man's Search for Meeting, because I thought this quote was pretty appropriate right about now. An abnormal reaction to an abnormal situation is normal behavior. I think that's a pretty appropriate perspective and quote, given what we are all experiencing right now with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, which is particularly challenging because we don't know when this is going to end. And of course, that certainly complicates things from a psychological, emotional view, as well as with regard to trauma. Here are a couple of the takeaways that I'm hoping will be beneficial to all of you. First of all, take what you need and whatever doesn't resonate with you. You can leave it, and that is okay. The second takeaway is that there are no perfect ways to navigate a global crisis that impacts all of us, even as us, even as healthcare providers, which is an unusual situation for us, because typically the people we are helping, we are not living through a similar experience with them. So this is a this is new for all of us. Um, that is okay. Remember that you're human too. You have needs and wants and desires. You also have your own set of fears, anxieties, and responses to what is going on. That is also okay. And for our generation, this goes without saying, but I want to say it anyway, this is new in uncharted territory. We're gonna make mistakes along the way as we try to help others. We may have to color outside the line, so to speak. And when I was working on this, I was referencing the fact that the United States Department of Health and Human Services has relaxed some of its HIPAA guidelines regarding different platforms that can be used for telemedicine in light of this crisis, and that is okay, but also, there has been a series of executive orders from Governor Whitmer that has relaxed some of the rules around scope of practice for certain folks. For example, in the medical profession, nurses and physicians assistants, because there's a shortage, can now treat patients who present with COVID-19. Finally, some of what we learned during our college training in the course of gathering our CEUs and other knowledge through webinars, books, seminars may not work at this time. We may have to improvise and that's okay too. You know, there's a saying from the Vietnam War that I have used often throughout my career and it is, it is what it is. I think that applies to this situation. Just a few sentences about who I am, and I am a social worker with a clinical license. I have a small private practice. I work primarily with individuals who have anxiety, depression, and trauma histories, and also young folks with serious mental illnesses. Um, spent time as a case manager for adults with serious mental illness, Oakland County CMH for seven years. Um, I've been a disability rights advocate for about 25 years, and currently I'm with the Mental Health Association in Michigan. And if you're not aware of who MHAM is, we are the oldest advocacy organization in the state that advocates for individuals with psychiatric conditions. We're primarily focused on public policy work and in influ influencing legislation that in fact, uh, impacts folks with behavioral health conditions. Um, and 
I think most importantly for me, I'm a human being like everybody else, and I have struggled with anxiety, depression, and obsessive compulsive disorder since childhood. Um, and the only reason I share that is to say, while I've, I've done a lot of work on myself and I've done a lot of work as a professional, I don't have any clear answers about how to deal with the current pandemic. Um, and like probably most folks, I'm still figuring out ways to take good care of myself so that I can be present and available for the people that I work with on a daily basis. So before we get started, I wanted to make sure that everyone is ready and that you're all seated firmly in your seats or in your chairs or on your sofa, wherever you are at home, or maybe you're in an office. But you know, I wanted to honor the fact that this is a situation where all of us are experiencing some degree of trauma. Some of us have some degree of trauma perhaps in our backgrounds. And so I was reading over some of Dr. Bessel van der Kolk's work, and I was thinking the best way to start is for us to make sure that we're grounded and that we're safe as we talk about coping within the context of the current pandemic. And you can see on the slides, but I'm just going to kind of take us through. So get comfortable if you're not already. And let's just begin by taking in a short breath, followed by a longer exhalation. If you're okay with a longer in-breath, please do. We know that for individuals with trauma histories, sometimes it's not beneficial for them to take in a long breath. So I'm just going to take a minute here and let's just kind of begin by a short breath and then a longer exhalation. Why don't you do that about four or five times? And let's do one more. Okay, now let's make sure that we're relaxed and we'll begin at the top of your body, noticing any bodily sensations or feelings, noticing if you're experiencing any anxiety right now or if you're worried about another situation or the current pandemic situation we have occurring. Notice your head your ears, your face, your neck? Do you feel any tenseness? Do you, what do you feel there? And as you move down through your head, your ears, your face, just kind of let it go. Now let's move down through the neck, through your the remainder of your body, your shoulders. Do your shoulders feel tense or tight? Do you need to maybe shrug them a little bit to let the tension go? Are your arms comfortably at your side? And do you feel your body in your chair? Do you feel your butt you're in your chair on the couch? Are your feet touching the floor? If so, that's good. Focus on feeling and being safe in your body and in your home or office or wherever you happen to be. Now let's just take a moment to simply pay attention to our surroundings. Notice the clock if you have one. Notice the sound of the furnace if your furnace is blowing. Or just for a few moments, focus on your own breathing. And just do a little bit of mindfulness in the present moment to help ground us. And then repeat this affirmation to yourself a few times, which is, I am safe in this moment. I am safe in this moment. Okay. Now we can begin. Thank you. Okay, so let's talk about being a social worker at this time, and we'll talk honestly about it. Is it hard to be a social worker in the best of times? Yes, it is. 
Is it harder to be a social worker right now, given everything that's occurring? Yep, it is. And as I was contemplating this slide and this part of the presentation, I thought it would be beneficial to sort of do an overview of the role of social workers and the values of social work, uh, which are really best summarized by the preamble to the NASW Code of Ethics, because this is what we represent as a profession. So our primary mission really is to enhance human well-being and to help meet the basic needs of all people. And our particular attention and focus is to the needs and empowerment of people who are vulnerable, oppressed, and living in poverty. And this is definitely a historical aspect and a defining feature of the work that we do. I won't read the whole thing, but we work to promote social justice and social change with and on behalf of clients. And currently, I think that once we get past our feelings about what's going on and how it affects us personally, our families, our communities, then we can get to a place where we can think about how there might be some opportunities embedded in this crisis. Um, but we'll get to that a little bit later. But what I wanted to validate and honor and affirm is that this is a tough time for all of us that do the work that we do. You know, we are by nature caretakers, nurturers, empaths. Some people are intuitives and we want to help other folks. And sometimes, oftentimes, social workers, we tend to help to the detriment of ourselves. This is going to be one of those opportunities where we're really going to learn that unless we care for ourselves, we are absolutely unable to help anybody else. And you're going to find out that I love quotes, as I said earlier. So here comes a great quote. As we talk honestly about fear, I thought this was a great quote because part of what's exacerbating our fear is the fact that this crisis, this, you know, um, devastation, this disaster is not over yet. And that's what makes this a lot more challenging than things that happen within a certain time frame. Here's some thoughts about anxiety and fear that I'd like for all of us to think about. I'm sure you've been thinking about it. You know, what makes the anxiety and the fear about this current pandemic so difficult for all of us. Um, one of the things um, that I've heard from my clients in my private practice has been talking about when is this going to end? When can I get back to my life the way that it was? When can I go out to my friends' um, houses and see them and visit with them? One individual mentioned to me the other day that going out to dinner, which was taken for granted previously, sounds like such a great opportunity and something that will probably not be taken for granted again. We now know the kids are not going to go back to school in Michigan, probably at all, till next year. Um, so there's a lot about this pandemic and the way that it's affecting us that makes it so much more difficult because there aren't any answers. Here are some other things to consider that you've probably considered. This is, again, uncharted territory. We've not had a pandemic of this magnitude since the Spanish flu in 1918, 1919. We've had some pandemics, of course, but not to this degree. There was a pandemic right after World War II. Um, you know, we've heard about other, like Ebola virus, H1N1, but this one by far is the greatest magnitude since the Spanish flu in 1918. I think a lot of us are concerned about the impact that the quarantine will have upon the economy, and we're worried about the possibility of a recession. And for those of us that are social workers, a lot of us work with people who live in poverty, 
the disabled, the elderly, children who are living in poverty, fear and with unstable family situations, the most vulnerable among us have already been struggling. And we ask ourselves, is the coronavirus going to make things worse as we look at resources and the way that resources have historically been allocated and distributed in a way that's not been fair and equitable? What is this going to mean for the people that we care about moving forward? As you know, we watch what happens as we see things unfold. And actually, one of the things Dwayne and I were talking about prior to the starting of this webinar is the fact that there are going to be some opportunities for advocacy within this um, current scenario because. Our folks still need to be protected and we still need to be advocating for them within the context of this current crisis. Question for us to ask ourselves, how does our fear interfere with our ability to help others? So some critical questions that came about in my mind that I've been asking myself as a social worker and frankly as a human being is, you know, do I feel equipped to know how to help my clients, even my family, my friends, my kids? Do I even know how to help myself at times because of how I feel? That answer depends upon where I'm at myself. Um, I will say an insert here, I'm sure you all know this, but limiting exposure to the media social media, Facebook, all of it is really critical because it's nothing but bad news. I know we also might feel like we don't have the answers to much of what is going on because we don't have the answers. And a reference point for this for me is even our leaders at all levels of government are struggling with knowing what to do. Does not bring a lot of comfort in some ways, but it also in other ways affirms the fact that we're all human beings and we've never dealt with this before. Another aspect, I don't know about all of you, but I was privileged to have great undergraduate education, great graduate training at Eastern. It's been a long time and I've lived through a lot, but my experience has not prepared me for something like this. So what about you? Do you feel ill-equipped or equipped to deal with this? If so, do you, how do you feel either way? I'd like to take some questions from those of you that are participating if possible. Well, people uh, type in their thoughts. Um, I just wanna, Thank you for centering us to start this. I think that was wonderful. And one of your earlier quotes that was just saying that's okay too. I feel like that is that's really um, important right now to remember that we don't always have the answers, and it's okay mm -hmm. to um, to not have the answers. Uh, but we did have one um, question that came through while people are thinking about how they're feeling equipped or ill-equipped right now. Um, kind of reinforces again what you were talking about does too much information being the media or social media produce anxiety overkill? And do you have any suggestions around um, dealing with that right now? Yeah, okay, thank you. Let me know when you want me to go back on, Dwayne. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, we had a question come through regarding the media and when does information become too much information and does too much information cause anxiety i would say absolutely it causes increased anxiety um, given the population i work with folks with anxiety some of them have become hyper focused on this and research everything they can about coronavirus and covid19 and they hear everything and all it does is add to paranoia. And what I'm telling my folks 
that I work with, including my own family members, because I have uh, two children that struggle with obsessive compulsive disorder, is stay away from the media. Stay off of Facebook. All you really need to know right now is, number one, you are safe. You don't have symptoms if you don't. And what do you need to do, factually speaking? What is the CDC telling you that you need to do to stay safe? If that means you stay in your house and you don't go anywhere to stay safe because you don't have to, then that's what you do. Are you washing your hands? If you're doing those things, then that's the best that you can do in the situation. Watching the daily or even with some media outlets, the like every hour, you know, letting us know how many more people have been confirmed to have COVID-19 or how many people have died as a result, ultimately isn't helpful. Because what it does is it adds to our collective sense that number one, we're out of control in this situation. There's not a lot we can do about it. Number two, all of you that are trauma specialists know that can actually re-traumatize and it's not very beneficial. So what I would say is limit the amount of time that you're spending wanting to know or hearing about these different scenarios. Great. Thank Fearing you. We have a few comments from through, Marianne. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, so some good points from folks. Uh, so here are just a couple of comments. Um, I feel equipped in a lot of ways with being able to validate people's feelings and concerns. I feel ill-equipped with my handling with handling my own self-care and anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, I feel best equipped as possible, and everyone seems to recognize that this is a unique and new situation. I'm using my CBT uh, ACT training with clients a lot right now, but have trouble with my own anxiety about adapting to telehealth. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel equipped. I'm using the same mindfulness, trauma work, body work, and therapeutic techniques as usual. There are obviously uh, intricacies to the pandemic, but containing emotions is a big part of the work now. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends on the day. Sometimes I feel equipped for handling my own stress and my clients. Other days I worry about the safety of my mother who's going through chemo and feel unable to fully help her. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't feel equipped at all. I have an elderly mother I care for and work in a residential setting. I'm scared that if I get mm -hmm. sick, I will get my mom sick. Um, yeah. Anxiety is through the roof. Webinars like this are making me more equipped. Thank you for providing this from a current student. Um, I feel ill-equipped all around as a parent, spouse, and someone who is immunocompromised, but also as a supervisor. I feel like nothing I do is right. I have the best intentions for all staff, but they often respond very defensively or negative to any and all actions uh, to try to keep mm -hmm. them safe but still employed. Um, mm -hmm. Balancing our due diligence to reach out to clients who have not been actively engaged in therapy or have canceled because they assume we're closed uh, and not over communicating. Mm -hmm. um, and it, uh, in this comment, it's interesting that I have found many of my clients are not absorbed in the crisis because their own problems are so challenging. Has anyone else experienced mm -hmm. that? And absolutely, mm -hmm. I think that's a big key. Okay. Uh, my husband is working at a hospital at this time, and he has communicated to me an overwhelming fear that the staff are feeling, as well as feeling of obligation. How do we help clients or friends, family members who are on the front lines? From what he has shared, a number of staff in this hospital have quit or have contracted COVID, and this all adds to the fear. It seems like they're experiencing primary, secondary, and tertiary trauma at the same time. How do we help them? Yeah. yeah. Um, definitely ill-equipped. I have nothing to fall back on as far as personal or professional experiences, which is it's really what I pull from in my practice, and there's very little literature on this as well. Mm -hmm. um, I feel ill-equipped with technology. I also struggle to engage clients who were engaged before. So mm -hmm. a lot of thoughts, and I would just say yeah. you're all, all valid, and I think we're all experiencing mm -hmm. a lot of that. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Dwayne. Thank you, everyone, for sharing your thoughts. Um, again, 
the tough part, and I know you know this and you've heard this, but this is the most difficult part. There are no easy answers or solutions to this because this is something that we've not encountered before. Um, there's a slide I was gonna jump to, but I, I, I guess what I wanna say is this here right now for all of you. Number one, thank you for sharing that. The second, the second piece for me is I'm getting to the place where I am accepting that this is actually happening. Um, you know, as somebody who has had a lot of death in my my life and my family, including uh, a husband 10 years ago um, at a young age, I have learned through those processes to get to the place of acceptance, especially, if, you know, someone like myself that wants to try to control everything. Um, but perhaps the best lesson for me is that to really understand, and it's hard to do right now, I know, but based on everything I'm hearing from all of you, you're all doing the best you can with what you have available to you. And that's really all that we can ask of ourselves in this situation. Um, I also want to respond to the comment from someone who said that some of their clients are not really paying too much attention to what's going on in the world because they have so many of their own issues. Um, in my work with my clients with severe mental illness, a lot of them have said to me they're used to being isolated, they're used to being lonely, they're used to struggling. They say things like, well, I know I don't have COVID-19 because I don't go out of my house. And, and are real honest about that. And so for them, this is normal, what's happening right now in the world. This is like a normal thing for them. Um, what I want to get to, and I was gonna do a slide that talks about why is it important to take care of ourselves first? And I wanted to hear from all of you but I think I have. But before I move on, I want to make sure there aren't other folks that want to say something either about why take care of yourself first or even how do you do that given what's the current scenario. Marianne, there's one more comment that came through that I think definitely fits into this, um, more about kind of managing your own self-care. Um, so this, this comment is, I'm a manager over two specialty clinics. My days are fully focused on managing my colleagues' fears and panics, sharing updates, encouraging self-care, and purposeful breaks, and also providing clear expectations about work. Then I go home to my family and do the same thing for my family. I'm literally mm -hmm. unsure how I am feeling myself. Yeah. yeah. And I think a lot, of, a lot of folks are in that same boat, of, uh, especially if you're running a business or a practice or probably faculty and you're, you know, taking care of students, how do you take that time and make sure that you all also thinking about yourself when there may not be a lot of time to do that. Right. Right. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, it's we are, you know, mental health professionals are fond of telling our clients to take care of themselves first. And yet they might have so many other people they're taking care of that by the time they get to themselves at the end of the day, all they want to do is go to bed or put on Netflix or something so that they can take their mind off of, you know, what's occurring. What I've learned to do over the years through some really stressful times and also times when I've been had a lot on my plate is to try to get up a half hour earlier than what I normally would. I get up pretty early in the morning these days, um, but, I find that if I can get up a half hour early, and for me, and, and I mentioned this later in the slides, but for me, what supports me is my own spirituality. Uh, my spirituality is, uh, my practice is a very important part of how I keep myself together. Um, there's no time, sort of, you know, recommended amount of time that you need to have for self care given that you 
a lot of you sound like you're stretched from what you know from morning till night and I understand that I've been there I took taken care of many family members and worked full time and actually went to graduate school through all of that but I get it so it's about being intentional I think and saying okay this is a priority for me um, because a lot of times it's burnout and I've experienced that we don't know we're burnt out until one day we can't get up and do it anymore and that's a scary place to be so sort of moving ahead because I know that we have to be done by one o'clock and I really appreciate all of the comments um, I think there's some difficult truths and realities that are part of the part of the overall acceptance process and those of you that do grief counseling know there's the different stages of grief and I think that's very applicable here and one of the the final stage is you know is acceptance and it takes folks a while to get there and everybody has their own process but understanding the truth and the realities you know gives us the opportunity to proceed in that direction so already you can see them on the slide not knowing when it's going to end when is it going to be contained that just adds to the fear a lot of us are isolated and some of us but some people can't work from home. Some of you are still working in clinic settings. You're speaking of family members that are on the front lines. Uh, those folks, um, my hat's off to them. I honor them because that is, it's tough work anyway, right? Um, we have the ongoing nature of the event that causes the anxiety and the fear, and we don't know all of the devastation. Um, for people with a history of trauma, this can be a time of increased anxiety and fear. It can also be a time in which old wounding can be resurrected. For other people, however, this can be a time to recall all that has been survived during life experiences. And I'll share just real briefly, I my kids are spread out. I have one in Missouri and I live in the west side of Michigan, but all my family's in the Detroit area and I did a Marco Polo with my three children and I reminded them of all of the things that we have lived through as a family and said if we can survive all of those things then we can certainly survive this I also reminded myself of my Hungarian grandmother whose family came from Budapest Hungary to the United States in the early 1900s and realized that my grandma and her family survived the pandemic of 1918-1919 and my grandmother who was an adolescent during the great depression told me stories about how her mother found creative and inventive ways to have them have a pretty good standard of living despite the depression of course one of which included bathtub gin but she was proud of that, my grandma. <laughs> it was kind of interesting. Um, so looking back at everything you've survived in your life, and you know, and if it's appropriate and it doesn't re-traumatize your client, reframing it that way so that they have a sense of power. Um, I have found with some of my clients that has been really, really beneficial to remind them of all that they have survived and that they do have the ability to go through this. Um, something that has helped me too is looking back historically at other pandemics that have threatened human beings, um, things that were a lot worse, like the bubonic plague, um, and how we've survived that. And, you know, of course, I also recognize realistically all of those things may not quell the sense that this may go on for a long time, and we fear what we don't know. Someone talked about cognitive behavioral therapy, and um, I love this quote from William James. So let's focus on what we can control right now as we consider the tools we have available to us to help ourselves and our clients. I didn't put it in the slide, but I think 
you know, I'm a big fan of AA and the 12 steps. And this is like recovery, one day at a time, sometimes one moment at a time. So we ask ourselves, what is under our control right now? What is happening in the present moment? Are we safe now? Are we okay now? And if that is true, then that's a place to start. Recognizing that a lot of you might have family and friends and loved ones or clients that are not safe right now or okay right now. But we start with ourselves. So question for you, what is in your toolbox? And a lot of things have been mentioned already, you know, um, cognitive behavioral treatment, acceptance and commitment therapy, meditation, mindfulness. Probably a lot of you do, you know, some of you might do yoga. Do you have, a re you know, your regular routine? Through all of this, it is really important uh, to create a regular routine. I know for myself, um, I have worked out regularly for almost nine years now, and I attended Planet Fitness regularly every morning about the same time and of course planet fitness is shut down now so it required me to punt which meant going before we were all quarantined and buying a set of weights and an exercise mat and lifting weights in my living room while I watched Netflix using my coffee table as a weight bench because that was how I had to improvise um, so it certainly does require us to become creative but Doing that has been really beneficial to me. Um, try to get regular exercise. I'm imagining that sleep is an issue for a lot of folks. I have clients that have said they're not able to sleep because they can't stop thinking about what's going on. And that's where you get into your toolbox, knowing that right now the anxiety may be pretty great. Some of the things might not work real well. So again, what are your tools? And what tools do we need that we do not have right now? I think there's a lot of that. And what role do our beliefs about ourselves and others play in the way in which we cope? So one of the tools that we use a lot in our line of work is reframing. And so you know what cognitive reframing is? that you know, in order to avoid catastrophic thinking, we need to consider what is happening now, which is why we talk about being safe now. We also look at a problem or a situation from a different perspective. I've seen a lot of blogs online, positive blogs that talk about things that they can be doing in their homes right now that they didn't get the chance to do when they weren't quarantined, for example, you know, are we going to be cleaning our closets? Are we going to be, you know, reading that book we never meant to read? Are we going to maybe, maybe we meant to be right. We wanted to be writers and we're going to write a book. Now we can do, as Dwayne uh, mentioned, there are webinars and Pesci's doing some trainings for folks that need their CEUs, face-to-face um, -face CEUs. This whole thing couldn't have come at a worse time for those of you who need to update your licensure at the end of April. So what are the things that you can do that take your mind in a different direction, that kind of redirect your attention? Um, you know, one of the things that's really been helpful to me in my work with MHAM is I've been working with the state and the NASW on the state creating a statewide emotional support line for residents of Michigan who are struggling with this current pandemic. And I think we're in a place now where the state is going to create such a thing. It'll be modeled after something they're doing in New York State. Um, and you'll be hearing more about it as part of the NASW because um, I'm working with um, Algeria Wilson on it and Max home. So, you know, for me, what's helpful to me is being able to do something productive that helps other folks. Um, 
the other part of the reframing, and I want to make sure I don't run out of time here, is um, the facts, and we talked about that. Um, you know, I talked with one of my clients who said she was afraid she was going to get sick. Every time she coughed, she thought she was getting sick with COVID-19. Then we talked about now we talked about the facts. She hasn't been out of the house in almost 14 days. The average time of onset is typically five and a half days. Then she said she would feel shortness of breath, chest pain, dizziness, and fatigue. I asked her to breathe, and she said, oh, I don't feel that. Well, anxiety can cause physical symptoms that might feel like COVID-19. Cognitive reframing, it's what we do. I talked a little bit about these tools a little earlier, you know, write in a journal, start that exercise program if you have, you know, um, some kind of, um, if you have like a stationary bike or other types of things, treadmill, you can start to do that. Okay. Again, Wayne Dyer, you cannot always control what goes on outside, but you can always control what goes on inside. Although sometimes it may feel like controlling what goes on interiorly it can be very challenging too. So I decided to reframe COVID-19, and I'm going to post that here in this slide. So my way of coping is to try to find the positive in things, even in the worst of circumstances. Um, so you can see here, C is the courage to face adversity, which is something, which is a muscle we're all building right now if we didn't already have it. For me, it's an opportunity to go within. It's also a validation of our humanity, our humanness. It causes us to do inner work leading to healing and empowerment. And it's a demonstration of resilience of human beings. And for me, it's a crisis is an opportunity to rethink, redo, and revise. And so in the recognition of time, I'm just wondering, Dwayne, if anybody has brought any more comments or questions forward. There has been a few comments about self-care, um, some of what you already mentioned, meditation, um, yoga practice. I know for me, one of my my general um, self-care methods was also going to the gym like your Planet Fitness. My gym has been doing online sessions or modified at-home workouts um, for folks, and that's been really helpful. Um, socially distant walking each day, um, at least giving a little bit of time to get outside of the house. Remembering that it's okay to be patient with ourselves and make rest a priority because we're caregivers, so that may mean a nap at some point when we normally wouldn't do that. Um, wow. uh, one comment we are experiencing as a group, uh, we are experiencing as a group devastating grief due, due to the pandemic, loss of previous normal life, the feeling of not being uh, able to be in control of the situation escalates our anxiety. Thank you so much for doing this webinar as it helps us to be together. Um, you know, I think the other thing that I've seen is the uh, unusual ways folks are finding to be in communication and contact with one another. So Zoom meetings, mm -hmm. through video gaming systems, through Facebook Live and uh, video chatting. Um, so I think people are getting more and more creative. My birthday was on Friday. <laughs> so it's an interesting time to have a birthday too. And so my family, we all had, we had a Zoom birthday party, right? And so everybody from all over the state just got together and we all had, we blew out a candle. You know? <laughs> and so I think, you know, but in some ways, I think that shows our resilience too. Um, and mm -hmm. that we're finding adaptive and coping mechanisms that we never thought we would have to use. And, you know, I'm hopeful, I know personally, that maybe this will better connect us going forward. And maybe those mm -hmm. folks that we had reached out to in a long time, I feel like a lot of folks are hearing from people that they may have not have heard from as regularly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, thank you for that. I agree. I had a Zoom meditation with my three children uh, Sunday because I am a big meditator and I wanted them to think about using meditation. So yeah, we had a group meditation 
around the state and one in Missouri. So thank you for sharing that and happy birthday. Um, oh, some other um, the last time oh, you're through, welcome. Um, just really quick, the last time that I think it's important, um, that's from Linda. I think that it's important to just recognize that we do not have to be productive at this time and we may just need mm -hmm. to be to survive mm -hmm. and that's okay. Yeah. Thank you for reminding us all of that, that you know what, we don't have to do it a doggone thing, but chill out if we're able to do that, take advantage of it because there's gonna be a lot of work to do when this thing starts to subside. So thank you for reminding us of that. I, I'll, I'll say that to myself. Um, here's some other tools for the toolbox. Um, we already talked about this, ways to maintain a sense of balance and normalcy. For me, the key to good mental health is balance and boundaries. We talked about meditation. One of the cool things about technology is you can find all kinds of great meditations online, YouTube. If you have Spotify, you can get podcasts. I mean, technology has been a wonderful thing through this. Also, mindfulness um, is wonderful. Um, other tools, yoga. Someone mentioned yoga. You know, online virtual support groups are popping up all over the place. So, and like I said, I'd never say this because I'm a technophobe and I frankly had a flip phone up until a couple of years ago. Uh, I'm grateful for technology right about now. So the final thing that I just, and this is also, you know, in your PowerPoint that you'll have, um, I did some research on finding meaning in suffering because suffering itself it can be really difficult to understand the why why are we going through this why does this have to happen and as i told a young person yesterday who i work with whose mother died in a car accident a couple years ago and this young person is struggling with the grief and said why i need to be able to blame somebody um I wanted to look at, you know, when we go through these situations as we are now, you know, what are the positives that come from it? And so I was able to find information about what's called post-traumatic growth. And of course, I recognize that we're not through this yet. But my hope as a social worker, as a human being, is that as Dwayne has said, that something positive will come from this once we go through the psychological processes that we need to go through. And so it's interesting that this whole concept of post-traumatic growth, which was first identified in the 90s, looks at the different choices that people have in terms of how they respond to something. Um, and it actually goes beyond resilience. It actually means looking for something good and something terrible and how you can use advance, you know, adversity as a catalyst for advancing to a higher level of psychological functioning. So I wanted to make sure I shared that, especially since I had Viktor Frankl, um, my second slide. Um, again, other tools in the toolbox, spirituality, religion. Okay, I don't want to belabor that. The other one is helping others. If you're in a place and in a space to help others right now, um, I find for myself that that's very beneficial because it takes me away from myself. Some of you may not be able to do that, and that's okay, too. That is okay. So we know there will be an end to the crisis, and here are just some thoughts for you to consider for you. What will you have learned about yourself as a result of this crisis? With some of my clients who are in a space to hear that, I've said, you know, maybe that's something to think about. What, if anything, has changed for you in terms of your view of yourself, the world, our life, or life? And what are you going to do differently as a result of what you've experienced? I chose this quote about the past and the futures because I like the very end, which says, don't give up in the middle. The middle is the most difficult part of this. And we know that middle is the most difficult part of any of these types of experiences, whether it be 
Um, someone is diagnosed with a terminal illness, then there's the middle, and then there's the part where the person actually makes a transition to death. That is really, really difficult, and that's where we can really get sometimes stuck. Again, more in these are the five positive changes after trauma. Um, and again, we're almost out of time, so I don't have a lot of time to spend on these. You can read through these. But I wanted to make sure that I added positive things to be thinking about in this time where it's nothing but negative information about how our fellow human beings are suffering and how we're suffering in ways too. Um, again, Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning, a uh, person that I greatly admire. And um, if you haven't read his book about his time in the concentration camp, I would, if you're in a place, again, to read it. Again, not a have to. None of this is have to. You might want to read it. It might be inspirational to you. So a couple more quotes. Maybe at the root of our fear is change and not knowing what that will be not knowing what it's going to be. One is never afraid of the unknown. One is afraid of the known coming to an end. I think that's going to be the grief for a lot of folks, all of us, is what we've had in our culture and society may not be the same after all of this is done. There could be a lot of positives, but there could be a lot of difficult, challenging changes for a lot of people, and that is what I think is driving most of the fear and the anxiety in addition to everything else. And finally, the goal is to arrive at a place of acceptance of the situation. It doesn't mean you're okay with it. it doesn't mean that you're condoning it. It just means that, again, it is what it is. There's nothing you can do about it. And I wanted to make sure that I included a quote from Actually, they realized that they spelled this individual's name wrong. It's uh, Thich Nhat Hanh is actually the way it's supposed to be spelled. But hope is important because it can make the present moment less difficult to bear. We believe that tomorrow will be better. We can bear a hardship today. And the final thing is, what are some global lessons from the pandemic? I've thought a lot about this. We're all interconnected and interdependent. We are all important, we all matter. One loss of a human life is one life too many that is lost. What we do in one part of the world impacts individuals in other parts of the world. What is the global community going to do differently as a result of the pandemic? And what are the other lessons? And for me, you can tell listen, lessons make the difference for me in how I look at things. I also wanted to make sure that I gave you some resources for you and your clients. There's a lot of good information if you're interested on SAMHSA's website about disaster, behavioral health, how to work with people that are, you know, trying to cope with the traumatic impact of a disaster. So I wanted to include that. And finally, oops, going the wrong way there, Marianne. Um, who is the Mental Health Association in Michigan? This slide has what we do, my email if you want to reach out to me, my cell phone, and our address in Lansing. And a final quote from Deepak Chopra, most people talk about fear of the unknown, but if there is anything to fear, it is the known. Thank you very much for your time, everybody. Uh, be well, take care of yourselves, and I really hope that this has been helpful to you. Marianne, I wanted to thank you again for, for being here with us today. I know I feel better <laughs> from the comments. I know that folks have really appreciated today's time. Um, before we, we um, hang up for today, I just wanted to say a few of the resources that folks have also put in the comments since you've been talking. Um, one is the preface to the book, Man's Search for Meaning and Introduction to Logotherapy. Um, it states that the central theme of existentialism, to live is to suffer, to survive is to find meaning in the suffering. Very relevant to today. Um, Robin recommends the podcast Unlocking Up by our favorite Brene Brown, especially episodes on FFTS and comparative suffering. So uh, that's a couple of other resources.
resources. Um, Megan uh, Ledin, sorry for pronouncing your name, last name on Megan, uh, posted a video, a YouTube video that she put together about staying off of social media, focusing on what you can control, and finding a project to stay busy with a comical twist. I did put that into the chat box, but I will try to also see if I can get these resources typed up in some way. Um, if folks have other things that they are finding helpful, please feel free to email those over to me, um, and we will make sure that those that get shared. So I just want to thank you all again for being here, taking the time out of your day uh, to be with us. If you um, need the continuing education or would like the continuing education, just uh, remember that you'll get a post-test link an hour from now. Um, so just fill that out. There's five questions as it relates to today's webinar. And please um, be looking out in the next couple of days for some news specifically as it relates to continuing education from us. The governor has put out some executive orders that impact continuing education and licensure. So we just want to make sure that we, you all have the most up-to-date information as that goes forward. We're just seeking some clarification um, before we send it out to membership. So just make sure to check your inboxes uh, later this week for that. So um, if for some reason does not get the link to the post test, which will be emailed out, please feel free to um, email me. But that'll come in one hour from today, uh, right now so at about 2 p.m. So if you don't have it by 2.30, feel free to shoot me an email. All right, with that, I just want to thank you all and thank again, Marianne, for your time today. This was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Take care of yourselves, everybody, and thank you again, Dwayne. Great, thank you.